All right. Well, so National Geographic, uh, this is our 125th anniversary this year. So we've been doing uh, information graphics, data visualization since uh, 1888. Uh, we produce uh, uh, complex infographics uh, and amazing visualizations, 3D, cartography, and things like that. Uh, for this particular graphic, we actually scan the whole skeleton of a cheetah to produce this visualization of how they can run so fast. Uh, and we try to play with our pages and give space to information graphics. Uh, this is uh, a Yosemite National Park. Uh, we have amazing photography and a three-page gatefold. And we produce this uh, visualization, this, you can call it a map or a diagram showing uh, the exact uh, path of every one of the climbing routes uh, to this mountain, El, El Capitan. So uh, in my opinion, this is also data visualization, of course. Uh, we have a very complex uh, process. Uh, a newspaper may spend uh, one day, of course, uh, and I know that because I have worked in newspapers most of my career, or maybe a week or two weeks in a complex graphic. We can spend sometimes over one year uh, working on the same graphic. Uh, you, can, uh, you should consider that, uh, for example, we know the lineup of stories in the magazine until the end of 2014. And of course, that, that will change, but we don't depend on breaking news. We analyze stories and we go more in depth. We don't really depend on breaking news, so we can work with plenty of time. And that doesn't work. We're working just on one graphic. Uh, we're working on multiple projects at the same time. And the, the format, as I said, that we, we are not doing very much on the web. We will do a lot. If I come here in a year, I will show you a lot of examples. Um, but it doesn't matter. Uh, thoughts are bigger than the things that deliver them. And relevant stories are, are, are what matter. Uh, personally, I think most data visualization on the web is, is too abstract, is impenetrable, and lacks good editing. Uh, good, uh, you, you see a lot of things like this, a lot of them. Uh, things that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, no one really understands very well. <laughs> and people say, well, that, that's amazing. This is a phrase from, a quote from Ben Fry. That's amazing even though I don't understand it. And how can, how can it be amazing if you don't understand it? That doesn't make any sense. So you see a lot of uh, these kind of things uh, that are a bit over the world. And sometimes there is good information, but they get too, too wacky and too crazy, I think. So we, we have a lot of information technology. Sometimes we just don't have any information or any relevant story to tell our readers. Uh, and on the web or on print, you see sometimes too much information and uh, things that are overloaded with information. Uh, we need better editing and simplification. You see a lot of that. Uh, we are, of course, known for amazing photography. Our photographers uh, travel the world. They can spend two months in the field and doing photography for a story. And typically, they will come back to us with between 20,000 and 50,000 photographs out of which we're going to publish just 10 or 12. Uh, I think probably your grandparents, uh, your grandparents uh, will tell you about National Geographic, and probably they first saw a photograph of a topless woman in National Geographic. <laughs> we have this uh, reputation of, uh, in that time of maybe even softcore pornography, we had a lot of <laughs> post photographs like this. Uh, I'm sure you have seen that. Um, so just a, a couple of weeks ago, I was curious to see how much of this reputation is actually true. So we uh, made this visualization. Uh, so you can see it, uh, the, the black dots are issues with topless uh, women photos. And then the, the circles, the rings, indicate the numbers of uh, photos of topless women in that issue. Uh, we are still working on this graphic, and actually we are going to publish it in the magazine. Uh, in a few months. Uh, today, the magazine and the photography in the magazine is, is very different. Uh, we we uh, tackle very controversial issues, uh, conflict, uh, war, like the war in South Sudan, and then the soldiers coming back from Iraq of, or Afghanistan with multiple injuries and how they adapt to life uh, back in the US, uh, poaching of uh, rhinos and elephants. So uh, it's a very different a magazine than the, the magazine your grandparents uh, or your parents uh, read. Uh, and as I mentioned, we have been doing information graphics uh, since our very first issue. These are, uh, this is a chart 
an amount that appeared in our very first issue, 1888, uh, already in color. And the society, National Geographic Society, was founded by a group of 33 explorers and scientists, and that included Alexander Graham Bell, for instance, the, the inventor of the telephone, who was the second president of the society. And ever since the beginning, we have been doing information graphics and, and data visualization. Uh, for instance, this is a, a graphic published in, I think, 1893, and is showing the increase of the total U.S. population based on the census data uh, from the very first one, including the racial breakdown. And the first census in the U.S. was in 1790, so include, uh, they included all the data for all those uh, census. Or this other one, published in 1905, is showing the immigration into the U.S. Uh, from all countries since 1820, um, and has an amazing amount of data. And this is great uh, data visualization as well. You can see every country contributing immigrants to the country and, and also the total number. So even today, we go through these old issues of National Geographic, trying to draw inspiration from them. And of course, from any kind of good visualization, like this uh, amazing uh, infographic by Charles Minard, and that is plotting the size of the army of, Nap of Napoleon when they tried to invade uh, Russia. Um, in the winter. You can see the thickness of the line show how many soldiers uh, were traveling through Europe. He started with 400,000, and the black line indicates how many of them came back, uh, and at the end, only 12,000 were alive. Uh, so that's an amazing visualization, and it works in many levels. Uh, you can see also a temperature chart at the bottom, and it's also a map, obviously, a very simplified map. So over the years, we tried to draw inspiration from, from everywhere, from this kind of information. This is a flow uh, chart published in the 1960s. And this is something very recent. This is a story showing, uh, we actually went to Astoria in New York, which is a neighborhood with a lot of uh, ethnic diversity. And we took DNA samples of uh, almost 200 people. Um, and then we tried to trace the path their ancestors follow since uh, we came out of Africa. Uh, we can know this because there are known mutations that appear in different places in the world, and those are present in all of us. So analyzing your DNA, we can know where your ancestor came from and what is the path they follow uh, through, through, through the earth. Uh, so you can see how people, their ancestors came back from the Middle East or from Asia. And these uh, four black lines, are the specific uh, paths of those four people in the photographs. Uh, one thing that uh, distinguishes National Geographic from many other publications is every single thing we do is original research. It's research done by us in my department, uh, and we constantly talk to consultants, to experts, to scientists, uh, to create visualizations like, uh, for instance, like this one. This is, uh, for this graphic, I, I went to China, I spent two weeks there. And these are the terracotta warriors. As you know, today they have lost all the colors. Uh, but we, there are some traces of pigment in these uh, statues. And uh, scientists are analyzing those. And they, they have a very good idea, or a very precise idea, of the colors of each of the, these statues. Uh, you can see it seems a bit chaotic. The, the chaotic, the colors of the uniforms are very different. That's because they brought their uniforms from home, actually. Uh, what is uh, better organized is the, the armor, the kind of weapons they had. And there are 6,000 soldiers in this pit, and we were able to reconstruct uh, a, a very good representation of the actual colors. On the left, you can see how the pit looks now. Then there are no colors uh, visible for visitors. Um, and we were able to actually track down and find the actual natural pigments that were used at the time. Uh, we went to a specialty art store in New York, and we were able to find a, a malachite and azurite, and uh, then, then the actual pigments that were used, and we were able to photograph those. And next to this uh, figure, which is the one where the color is best preserved, it's very, very rare that uh, we, they know so much about uh, an individual figure. So we do a lot of original research. Uh, uh, recently, we have been working for months with uh, NOAA and FEMA and the Army Corps of Engineers to come up with new models of uh, sea level rise. Uh, for instance, this is uh, Manhattan, of course. And uh, 
we uh, we were having very a lot of difficulties to get uh, good information from them and at the end uh, our graphics editor Ryan uh, Morris uh, was able to find a way to uh, interpolate this model with a lot of detail based on the on the very coarse uh, models they have for yeah. sea level rising and we are going to publish this even before the army course of engineer um, shows this kind of information to, to congress uh, so we try to do very careful editing and simplification. Uh, we have 40 million readers and we have to be aware that uh, people have different ways of looking at information graphics and, and some people don't understand many of the even basic formats. I mean, uh, most people don't even understand a scatter plot, and that's, that's true. Uh, for instance, uh, only one out of every 188 photographs that uh, our photographers take in the field is actually published in the magazine. And of course, there are, there are occasions where more is more. Uh, for, ex for instance, for a reference map or, a, or an atlas plate, uh, you want to put as much information as, as you want, town names and river names and geographic locations. And this is a map published, I think, in 1941. And it's showing um, all, the inter all the boundaries in Europe um, by the time that Germany invaded uh, Czechoslovakia. Uh, so this map was so detailed that uh, it was actually used by the U.S. military and the allies uh, in the field, in Belgium, in France, and then they, were, they posted thousands of these for the soldiers uh, because they have every road, and they were, it was far better than anything the government had in this occasion. And actually this map was also used after the war uh, by the president and the allies to, to actually divide uh, Europe and to, to trace new boundaries. And they have multiple copies of this National Geographic map, and that's the one that they annotated and used extensively, and they had to order new copies from us. And so, so sometimes more is more. Uh, for instance, we also published this uh, supplement recently about the Civil War. And there are so many Civil War um, buffs out there, people that know every single detail about the war, that uh, we wanted to cater to them. This is a a map showing the path of two regiments leading up to the Gettysburg uh, battle. And based on uh, historical archives and diaries, a lot of investigation that went on through six months, uh, we were able to, to trust day to day the path of uh, each of the regiments, including quotes from different uh, soldiers in the field. So it's a very, very uh, complete work. But those are isolated cases when you want to show a lot of information. Normally, we want to try to simplify and offer only what is relevant. This is a supplement showing all the rivers in the world. And if you look at it uh, closely, there is nothing else than rivers. There are no boundaries, no outlines, uh, no country names. It's just uh, rivers, uh, permafrost, aquifers. Um, and that's, that's enough. That's what is relevant. And we want a very clean and very immediate understanding. And the important thing always is, is, is to have a good idea, not only just simplifying, is to have a good idea. Uh, the typical chart forms we know have, uh, have been there since the 1800s. Uh, William Playfair, of course, uh, came up with the idea of uh, plotting information across two axes in a, in a bar chart or in a fever line um, on a, or in a pie chart. But we try to find new ways of, or different ways, original ways of uh, showing statistical information. Uh, this is a very simple graphic showing what are your odds of dying of different causes, different diseases. So the red circle is, of course, your total odds of dying, which is 100%. And then inside, you see circles of different sizes uh, showing different causes. Like, I think cancer is uh, one out of five. Um, stroke is one out of 24. And at the very end, the little ones, you see things like legal execution, or, or being, let's see, earthquake, lightning. So we try to do graphics that are not too complex, but are original and offer good information. This is showing the imports of oil by China in 1996 and 2006. And you can see the exponential growth, the incredible growth. Uh, it's, it's really amazing. And the different color bands show the, the, which can, continents in there, in this oil is coming from. Or visualizations like this showing every single uh, space 
unmanned space mission uh, to two different planets in the solar system. Of course, then the scale is not accurate in the distances, but uh, we are showing. <laughs> but it's an effective way of showing the number of missions to each of these uh, places. So it's important to come up with original ways of displaying uh, statistical and cartographic information, like uh, cartograms is something we use sometimes where you distort the shape of uh, countries to, to show uh, geographic, uh, geographically relevant information. For example, we are showing here the population on, of the world, so the different country shapes are distorted to show that. And next to it, we show consumption in the world. So it's something very effective, uh, even at an emotional level, you can see, and then the amazing difference. Uh, this is from a, a Portuguese uh, magazine. Uh, it's also a graphic that is not exact, that it has a, a lot of impact, even at an emotional level, as I said. It's, uh, the red represents people in favor of the war in Iraq, white is people against the war, and blue is people that don't know where Iraq is. So, cartography and graphics with impact. This is uh, uh, during the earthquake in Haiti, there was a crowdsourcing movement to, to map uh, places that were, uh, were, there were no good maps available, and first responders found a lot of difficulty. And uh, thanks to OpenStreetMap and, and people collaborating in these maps, uh, they were able to quickly locate uh, so many locations and, and, and places where to, to get food, etc. Uh, as I said before, we have uh, 40 million readers. We publish uh, 5 million copies of the print magazine in the US and one more million uh, in our international editions. Um, and of course, we have uh, young readers, uh, mostly for our digital editions, but many of our readers are, are like this. And the average reader of the a reader of National Geographic or, or the New York Times is close to 60 year old. And, and very often, to be honest, we lose subscriptions just because, because people die. Uh, so we need to keep attracting uh, young readers, but uh, we also need to be very careful of how people like this and read our magazine, and, and, uh, and in particular how they look at information graphics. So we need to make sure that um, things are easy to understand. Uh, one of the speakers uh, said this yesterday, and, and I think it's very true. Uh, speed of understanding is important, and correct information is even more important. Uh, so that's important to, to remember. So we try to appeal to to average readers, uh, and we try to humanize information, statistical information. Uh, this is a poster we published uh, uh, when the world's population reached seven billion people. Uh, we wanted to see what, what does this mean, and what is the average uh, pe person on Earth? Uh, so looking at the statistics, we saw the average person on Earth is a 28-year-old Han Chinese male. So based on that, uh, we were able to create this poster. And there are 7,000 uh, figures, 3D figures, uh, plotting that face. Uh, each of them represents 1 million people alive on Earth now. So you can see and on the sides, we have some statistics about people. And this is not the face of a particular person. This is a composite uh, photo. Uh, and we talked to the Chinese Academy of Science uh, and they were able to provide us a composite photo based on 190,000 actual 28-year-old Chinese males, uh, and they produced this composite uh, for us. So we look at data visualization at beyond charts. I mean, you, you, most of the data visualization that you guys are doing is, is of course based on, on charts, cartography, but uh, we look at, uh, well, probably this is a particularly difficult to understand example, but we look at uh, ways to display data that are very different. For instance, this is data visualization. Uh, this is a reconstruction we did of, of a female Neanderthal, and it's extremely ac accurate, every single uh, bone is based on actual fossils. Um, this is the original uh, Neanderthal fossil found in Germany last century. And uh, a couple of years ago, we wanted to create a new reconstruction because there was new genetic evidence on Neanderthals. The DNA of Neanderthal was being 
and decoded, and there were there was new evidence. Uh, so we talked to a couple of artists in the Netherlands, and they are called the Kennis Brothers, and they are what we call paleo artists, and they do painting and, and anatomical reconstructions that are very very precise and very f and grounded on on actual science. Uh, uh, they live in the Netherlands, and they have this agreement with different zoos in the Netherlands, where when an animal dies, they can retrieve the carcass and they uh, study those animals to create these uh, accurate uh, reconstructions. So we wanted them to create a Neanderthal reconstruction for us. We wanted to make a female Neanderthal because some of the evidence and behavioral evidence, not DNA in this case, was that uh, females uh, participated in hunting along with males, which is not typical of uh, Homo sapiens, um, but uh, Neanderthal females did. So they started sketching things like that. And at the beginning, we thought this was too idealized, too quiet. Uh, we wanted a pose that was a lot more defiant. Um, and after a lot of sketches, I, I think they were not getting it right. So I asked one of my colleagues, Fernando Baptista, uh, to, to just pose for me. We send them photographs back and forth. And we always do a lot of sketching, always. And at the end, they come up with this, which I thought is something we could work with. And the next step was to find uh, actual replicas of fossils, uh, Neanderthal fossils. Uh, you, of course, never find a complete skeleton, just uh, small pieces. So through this company, we were able to find part of a thorax, for instance. And this is where the different uh, parts of that thorax come from, what uh, actual fossils. So it's a very, very accurate reconstruction. Uh, in this company, which is called Bones and Clones, you can, if you want, you can buy a carrying case for a human school. Uh, it's, it's $90. So first they created a clay model in their studio in Amsterdam. Uh, but we had a problem. The best preserved skeleton was the skeleton of a, of a male Neanderthal. Uh, the best thorax. So they had to take one eighth, one eighth of an inch out of each vertebra, uh, take everything apart, and one eighth of an inch out of each uh, rib, and then put it back together to create a smaller thorax, uh, to create a female thorax. So they made this uh, model, very accurate model, working with scientists at uh, Yale University. Then they fix the pose with iron bars. And the next step, they, uh, that all that work in the skeleton that took over two months uh, is never going to be seen by anyone. That's just to give you the right body proportions. And then they reconstruct the layer muscles with clay. And at the end, they create a, a cast. And the final uh, reconstruction is made of silicone. This is almost finished here. We, we call her Wilma, by the way. And you can see that the characteristic anatomy of Neanderthals here are like a very pro protruding mid face, the receding chin, the very prominent eyebrow. And they are, they are different from Homo sapiens. So all this work of uh, six months uh, just to have three photographs in a, in a story. And th this illustrates, and this is by a different paleo artist, uh, John Gurci. This illustrates a bit of the process of reconstructing the face, where they have to build every single uh, muscle layer. And you see this uh, different thickness uh, squares. That indicates the thickness of the skin in different parts of the face. Like the forehead is very thin, the cheeks are uh, thicker. So based on that, they, they create something like this. So it's very grounded on, on science. You can see the amazing realism of this face. Uh, and of course, being National Geographic, we couldn't just photograph our Neanderthal in the studio. We had to take her to Spain to photograph her next to the cave where some of this uh, DNA evidence was found. So the photographer and the Kennis brothers took uh, our reconstruction to the Netherlands. I was there. The photographer was there. Uh, and that's uh, Wilman next to the cave where some of this uh, DNA was found. Uh, but we also realized that vegetation in this cave was too, it was very green, very lush. And we knew that uh, Neanderthals live in a much colder climate in Europe. So we took her to a national park nearby where there are mountains and, and snow. 
And we also took uh, some photographs. This uh, lady, for, for scale comparison, and this lady lives in the farm that is on top of the cave. So we photograph both of them together to have uh, some facial comparison. That, that didn't work. <laughs> and we also had that information graphic uh, comparing the uh, female human skeleton with the Neanderthal skeleton. Uh, and th these are the Kennis brothers, and two twin brothers in the Netherlands with an amazing knowledge of uh, anatomy and fossils. Uh, so I say this is data visualization because every single measurement in that model is, uh, is grounded on science. And they are also amazing painters, and you never know which one of the brothers is actually painting one part of a, a painting or, or another. And to do this, they also construct uh, clay models just to have them the right proportions. And this is an illustration by Fernando Batista, one of our senior graphics editors, showing the anatomy of lions. So we use a lot of these reconstructions and by paleo artists. This is also by John Gurci. And you can see the amazing realism and that very true expression in the, in the face. Or things like this reconstruction of a crocodile and that live 110 million years ago. This is a clay model. And later on, we just applied some Photoshop on it. And we do the same with uh, 3D diagrams that we also consider data visualization. This is a reconstruction of the uh, sinking of Titanic that we did uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, you have probably seen graphics very similar to this for years. Um, but uh, we work with uh, James Cameron. And James Cameron gathered a team of scientists and engineers to create a new theory of how uh, Titanic sank. So we spent uh, also several months working with him and his team of engineers. And they developed this new model of uh, how every single piece uh, broke, how what uh, rotation it had when it fell. So uh, it was a very, very complicated thing to do even at the end. It looks like an illustration that uh, you could uh, almost make up in, in little time. Uh, this is one of uh, at least 50 emails uh, from James Cameron. He's, he's particularly difficult to work with, actually, uh, giving us a corrections uh, and, and comments about this uh, model. Uh, so as I mentioned before, it's important to, to strive for simplicity, for understanding, and to have a story to tell. Um, I, I cannot deal with these kind of images on the web, really. Uh, I like things that look like this, things that are based on pictograms, things that are very simple. This is the lifespan of uh, different animals. Uh, created by isotype, uh, I think it's in the 50s or 60s. Very beautiful, very simple graphic. Um, and at National Graphic, I can say that we use the most sophisticated tool in the visualization. <laughs> and I'm really convinced it's that one. We do a lot of uh, sketching. We need to think through how we're going to represent information visually. And, and that, that takes thinking and sketching and, and drawing with pencil and, and paper. Uh, before you jump to the, to the software. Uh, this is by John Grimwood, one of the um, best graphics people out there. So he does a lot of pencil sketching. And we do too, even for historical uh, paintings like this, uh, uh, also we have to work back and forth with uh, consultants and scientists. So uh, we send them sketches like this, and then they uh, find mistakes in the architecture, for instance. Uh, we fix that. We create a new sketch, we send it back. So this back and forth takes a lot of time. And this is the, the final painting for this piece. Uh, even in a painting like this, uh, you can see these uh, birds flying in the background. Uh, to be able to paint those, we need to send this illustration to an ornithologist to make sure this type of bird was present at this time in this particular place. Uh, one of the advantages we have over other media is that uh, the National Geographic Society provides grants, money to scientists to study different issues. And based on that, we are sometimes able to be the first to work with them to visualize that type of information and sending sketches back and forth. Uh, so that gives us an advantage, actually, to visualize information. Uh, this is a map showing the underground tunnels in Paris. Uh, it's an, um, the entire city underground is uh, filled with catacombs and, 
uh, former quarries is amazing. And two of our graphics editors spent a week down there actually looking at and these passages, uh, what was closed, what was open. It was an amazing investigation work. And, and this is what you see in our sources so many people sometimes, uh, people we work with, consultants, experts. So it's, it's a complicated and long process. Uh, this is the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, the Cathedral of Barcelona that is still not finished. And our graphics editor, Fernando Batista, created this illustration showing uh, the gray parts that are not built yet, and the, the brown parts are already there. Uh, and he spent so much time looking at the floor plans of the architects because they don't have any actual 3D visualization of it. They're, in fact, still working on these floor plans. He spent so much time that he was able to spot a couple of mistakes in these four plans, and the architects actually fixed them. <laughs> so it's important to have a, a relevant story to, to tell. Sometimes I see uh, visualizations, and I, I just wonder why they were done. Um, and of course, you have to experiment and see interesting things. These are all the, the frequency of all the wars in uh, War and Peace, the, the novel. Um, but what was the point of that? I mean. Of course, you can do this, but uh, sometimes I th think we are missing opportunities to do other stories that may be a bit more relevant. Or this, this is a very pop popular visualization of the, the Bible, I think, and different passages, how they are connected with each other. Um, but it's impossible to follow these lines, of course, and, and no one is going to even try. That's the kind of thing that people say, it looks so cool, but no one understands this, really. But we draw inspiration in, in that one, actually, to do this uh, simpler graphic based on this idea. Uh, it was a story on the King James Bible, and this is showing how a different previous versions of the Bible are connected, uh, which ones are translations of others, uh, etc. Uh, in this story, we also had this word cloud showing how some phrases that have been, and that uh, come back from the King James Bible have been popularized in the English language and how often they are present in, in books. Uh, we do, of course, a lot of uh, cartography and maps and um, amazing geographic visualizations like this, um, but this is actually relatively simple to do. This is a, a 3D model uh, based on DM, digital elevation models, and a satellite uh, photograph, high resolution photo drop on top of this 3D model. Uh, we also did this uh, visualization. This is K2, which is the second highest mountain in the world, and we work with the German Space Agency on this 3D model. But I'm, I'm more interested in cartography that is where information is revealed. Uh, we show thematic uh, maps, uh, we show data in maps uh, to try to reveal patterns that are not immediately apparent. This is a very famous map uh, from John Snow in 1854, I think. And he was able, then there was a cholera epidemic in London, and he was able to find the source of this epidemic um, by plotting the location of different uh, uh, where people got sick or people died, and he was able to trace the origin of this epidemic to this particular uh, fountain, to this uh, water well in the city. So we try to show geographic patterns uh, using GIS. For instance, this is showing uh, which areas in New Orleans are uh, below sea level. You can see that in the blue colors. And the circles indicate how many people are still living under sea level in those areas and are still uh, at risk. So you can, uh, you can use data to see uh, interesting patterns. You can see here how this was done after the uh, Gulf of Mexico um, spill. Uh, we plotted every single oil platform and pipeline in the Gulf of Mexico, and you can see how this landscape has been devastated. This is the landscape of uh, Northwest North Dakota. You know that there is an oil boom going on, fracking, natural gas. Uh, 
And the way this landscape is being transformed is amazing. Also, you can see also more than 3,000 uh, oil wells and that in this landscape. And you can see also how they overlap with different aquifers in the area, uh, with the risk being that uh, some of these may find their way into the, into the water table. And this is a 3D graphic showing how fracking works. Uh, for, this, for this particular story, we did one of the first uh, animations for the web and the iPad. And I'm going to show you. Shale formations underlie much oh. of the United States. They are the and it's um, looking for the sound cable. Yeah. Okay. I know what it looks like. Oh, there, there it is. Okay. There you go. Oh, that's the one. Yeah. Sorry. Don't start yet. I'm going to turn the one. Shale formations underlie much of the United States. They are the source of natural gas and oil. Historically, the formations have been difficult to drill. Today, it's possible with the technology of fracking. In North Dakota's Bakken Formation, fracking started in 2006. Nearly 8,000 active wells now dot the landscape. Deep underground, horizontal pipes stretch up to two miles long. The Iverson well, drilled in 2010, illustrates the fracking process. The well plunges nearly two miles down, with cement and steel casing inserted to prevent leaks into groundwater. The well curves when it reaches the Bakken, layers of shale that sandwich a layer of sandstone. The pipe follows the sandstone because that's where shale oil collects. Fracking begins by forcing plastic balls down the well. The balls open sleeves in the pipe to expose holes. Fluid is then pumped down the well under extremely high pressure. The fluid shoots through the holes and fractures the rock. Over the course of three days, this well fracked the rock 29 times. The bursts show where fissures were created. You see, well actually, um, these uh, explosions you see, those are actual representations of them. They're based on seismic um, data. Uh, so they're not just uh, lines drawn there. Um, so that's, uh, we're starting to do this kind of animation and we, uh, normally we believe that uh, voice narrated uh, things like this are easier to, easier to grasp by readers rather than uh, things with a lot of interactivity. In the iPad we see over and over, for instance, that all people do is scroll, scroll and they completely pass over buttons, they don't, they don't do anything with them, they just scroll. So we try to do things that are relatively easy to, to digest and to navigate through. Uh, this, as I told you before, is a 3D model of a cheetah. For this, we uh, actually scan a skeleton of a cheetah. We did a CT scan with a skeleton by the, from the Smithsonian Museum. And it's an amazingly detailed model. And then we use, we animated this skeleton uh, on top of a slow motion video of a cheetah for the iPad. So as I mentioned before, whenever you see this kind of uh, illustration in National Geographic, it's uh, extremely accurate. It's based on science. And uh, sometimes it's difficult to know how to translate this, this into a small screen or into the iPad, what to do with it. Uh, so we come up with all sorts of ideas. In this particular case, we explain uh, through a video how this model was created. Uh, this is uh, Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, which is a, one of the first uh, religious temples in the world.
La primera, la primera razón para construir un modelo es The first reason for building a model is it provides help in terms of perspective to find the best vantage point for lighting purposes as well. It's having a 3D reconstruction, but real, one that you can move and seek out all the proper perspectives by elevating or lowering them. It's fundamental. The most exciting thing was going into one of the circles where the central pillars are, stand in the middle and look up to see how high they were. It's something special being at this site and imagining how it could have been almost 12,000 years ago. Gobekli is a beautiful story. It was the first temple in the world, the birthplace of religion. It carries with it a certain mysticism that sparks the question, why? Everything was questioned to the archaeologist Klaus, but why did they build these shapes? It's a thread of questions, the offerings. At the end it's like a puzzle, an architectural puzzle, a puzzle of knowledge with the remains they've found, and in the end what we do is put the pieces together and make a recreation. So we often like to build these uh, physical, actual three-dimensional models, as you see. Um, I have always been fascinated by these kind of exploded diagrams and views, and, and recently I discovered the work of this uh, person, Damian Ortega, who does uh, these exploded views with actual objects, like a, like a car. And I think that's, that's incredible. Or this other very simple visualization. The average car produces 20 pounds of carbon dioxide in a day. And I, I saw this on the web. I think it's just so, so cool. Um, Amanda was uh, talking yesterday about uh, goofy comparisons. And I found this also on the web that I think is very interesting. It's a visualization of how much carbon dioxide is produced every day in New York City. I think each of these is uh, what a car produces in one day. That is amazing. Um, I'm going to jump forward a little bit, actually, because otherwise I'm not going to have time. Just to tell you a little bit about what we are doing um, right now on the on the iPad, on the, on the iPhone, actually. Uh, more and more people are looking at, uh, ha at graphics and are, are getting their information primarily on their smartphones. Uh, so we have an iPhone edition where uh, we are trying to show information graphics, and it's, it's, it's very difficult, I mean, because we do complex graphics, how to translate that to, to the iPhone. Uh, so we have an application, we have uh, our stories are read with voice by the authors, so that's something you can listen to during your commute. Uh, we animate the covers. And we are able, when we do a video, for instance, an animated video, we can link to that easily. Um, but sometimes we need to just refer to the, to the readers to the iPad edition or to the web um, because some things are too complicated. Uh, we use Adobe DPS uh, to do very simple animations uh, within InDesign, the, the layout software we use. Uh, you can have some basic interactivity, which is very, very simple, almost pedestrian. But in a way, I like that because it, it doesn't let you go crazy just touch things and other things appear. It's very, very simple. But simplifying maps like this 
is always a challenge and, and a lot of things have to go. Uh, so we are still adapting to this new reality of how uh, to take a graphic like this about uh, sequoias and what to do with it on, on, on the iPhone. A very simple range map and a very simple representation of the anatomy of a tree. Or this other map about the poaching of elephants and the traffic of elephant, uh, elephants to, to Asia. This is also redesigned completely to give a very simple, very different experience on the, on the iPhone. And of course, the iPad. The iPad, uh, we have an edition for the last uh, three years, and everybody was expecting this uh, new platform. Uh, publishers were thinking it will save uh, print media. And, and it's been a struggle for most of them. Uh, it was going to give this godsend thing. And everybody in media was expecting this with so much anticipation. But uh, if you look at, at the iPad, most people are using it just, just to play games. And that's, that's the reality for things like this. It's a great game, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and publishers have had the problem of Apple uh, uh, requesting or wanting a 30% uh, of the revenue. So for most publishers, uh, uh, Apple is something like this. But anyway, we are struggling to find how people navigate, how people use their fingers to, to navigate through information graphics. And I think we are getting there. Uh, we were named two times magazine app of the year by the National Magazine Awards. And I think right now we are the number one magazine application. And ju just to finish, I will mention the, the question that Amanda uh, posed yesterday. Uh, what are we missing because of the tools we are using in data visualization? Uh, there is a lot of data available there, um, but we are missing something. We are missing some emotion and some connection with our readers. So we cannot overwhelm them with the statistics. This is a story we did on the Sami people, an ethnic group in the north of Europe, in Finland and Sweden and Norway, I think. So we were looking for good statistics uh, for a long time, how to represent the socioeconomic status of these people, etc. But at the very end, we thought we will do something very different and, and that will have a much more emotional connection to the reader and that's all we will offer uh, in the way, not of information graphics, of trying to get to know these people. So we did a video that I will show you to finish. Oops. Well, um, I don't know what else to say either, so thank you so much. <laughs>